in verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, Yet let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. I want to just share with you for a few moments in this theme of the last part of this chapter 12 about a kingdom that cannot be shaken. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, I love you. Thank you, Lord. You have blessed us again, Lord, not just to be able to come into a building uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ, but Lord, a, a, an opportunity to worship you, an opportunity uh, to experience you and your presence manifest among your people tonight. Thank you for the songs that have already been sung, every worshiper in the house. Touch us now as we get into your word, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts again, Lord, that we may receive everything and all things that you would have for us in this night. We praise you and thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. God bless you. The kingdom of God cannot be shaken. If it could have been shaken, it would have been. Think about all that the kingdom of God has suffered. It did not tell us that the kingdom of God suffereth violence. Think about all that the, the church in the Old Testament sense went through during the times there of, uh, of even uh, captivity and, and so many different things. I won't take time to go into all of that. Not only them, but also in the New Testament and even in the even in uh, the history within the last, you know, ever since the day of Pentecost, from the early days of the church all the way through into our present day, that all the things that the church has went through, all of the things that the word, how the word of God has been, attempts upon the word of God to be disproven, and even with every archaeological find where they think, well, finally we're going to prove some things wrong in the Bible. They only find more and more all the time proving that the Word of God is, is, is factual and true. And think about all that the things that they went through, even, even in our own lives and our own churches that we have attended over the years, 
We know that the enemy, hell itself, has come against the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God cannot and will not be moved. Cannot and will not be moved. No matter what happens, no matter what takes place, the kingdom of God cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God cannot be moved. Not one inch can it be moved. And because uh, we're established on truth, and, and we'll get to that. The kingdom of darkness cannot shake the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God cannot be and will not be moved. It is unmovable. The kingdom of God is undefeated. The kingdom of God is eternal. It's everlasting. It is unshakable. For thousands of years now, as hell has come against the kingdom of God in so many different ways, the kingdom of God is not only standing tonight, but it has not moved. Now, people have been shaken. Ministries have moved. People, preachers, churches, you name it. There has been some uh, movement in those areas, but the kingdom of God has been established and it is and always will be unmovable and unshakable. That's why the greatest place to plant your feet is on the word of the living God. All this other stuff that's going on in the world today, my goodness, I, uh, there, there is no truth in many people's minds and hearts any longer. And that's why this world is seemingly over the past decade has been just thrusted into such a state of uh, confusion like I've never even imagined would come upon this earth, but here we are. It's because people have gotten away from that which is unmovable, that is the Word of God. People have been shaken, preachers have been shaken, ministries and churches have been shaken, but the kingdom of God will never be shaken. Kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. I begin to wonder about this. I looked it up today. The kingdom of God, that phrase, and the kingdom of heaven is found 101 times in the Bible, 69 kingdom of God, and then the, the rest there, 32, is, you can find the kingdom of heaven. But all of those are, all of those instances are found in the New Testament. None of, that's never, those things are never mentioned uh, in the Old Testament. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. And, but it's because it was in what we refer to as the New Testament when Jesus came, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. That is when the kingdom of God came to this earth. Uh, Jesus never taught that there would be a literal restoration of the kingdom of Israel. This was a part of the uh, misunderstanding, the misperception of the Jews. They thought, well, Jesus, the Messiah, he has come and he has come to establish the, the kingdom of God on this planet. There's going to be a restoration, an overthrow of Roman rule, and it's going to establish Israel. But that was never the message. They misunderstood the prophets. They misunderstood the message that the Lord uh, came speaking as he came. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom, and it is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God uh, would not come by just simple observation. The Bible tells us this in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. The Pharisees there were demanding uh, the spiritual leaders of that time they were uh, demanding him, tell us, when is the kingdom of God going to come? And he answered them, he said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, it's here, lo, it's there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. This kingdom would be a reality in the hearts of every true disciple in Christ, right? The kingdom of God is within you and I, amen? This building is not the kingdom of God. We say it often, this, this building is not the church. We call it the sanctuary. This is a building in which the church gathers together 
to worship and for discipleship and those things. But this is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit that is within you. The, the place in which Christ has taken up residence in your life. And he is the one that enables us to be the church everywhere that we go. The kingdom of God would be that reality. It's a reality that those of us here tonight, you've been born again. When we were born, when you got born again, all of a sudden you became much more aware that there is something else going on on this planet other than the things that are just carnal and fleshly and, and the activity. We became acutely aware that there, would, there was a spiritual realm that was taking place. There, there was something else going on. When you got born again, worship services would take place and uh, the presence of God would come in so strong and you begin to understand we're all here, but there's somebody else in the building other than just us, right? And so uh, we become aware and we've been, ever since we've been saved, we live in it. It's a part of who we are. We're a part of it. And we are experiencing daily the victories that Jesus established and won for you and I uh, way back on the cross of Calvary. This is why Jesus told his disciples there uh, in the book of Mark, he tells them as they're standing there that they would never taste death. Right? Would they die one day? Well, we know that they did. They're not living now. And, uh, but what he was saying there, you have already the kingdom of, you have entered into the kingdom of God and you're going to live forever. It's established forever. And uh, the, sp the spirit, spiritual kingdom could, be, could only be seen and can only be seen by someone who has been born again. The Bible teaches us this in John chapter 3, verse 3. He, Jesus, this is the conversation that's going on with Nicodemus. And he tells him, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He begins to tell us what the kingdom of God is not in Romans chapter 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meek. Or drink. It's not the things of the flesh. It's not the things which you are participating in. He said, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And we, we have entered this kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ and by the grace of God. Listen, the Bible even tells us that there will become a day when heaven and earth is going to pass away. It tells us that you, the, the times we live in, they change from, from season to season. You know, this world changes, people change. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we're a part of and that's living on the inside of us will never end and it will never be shaken. Go with me to verse 18. Let's read a few verses there and we'll see what he's, how he's speaking to these Hebrews. For ye are not... Come unto the mount that might be touched. You, you, you have, you're, used, you're used to talking about this mountain, right? We'll talk about what he's talking about. But this mountain that you're approaching, the way you're approaching out, you can't touch this. It's, it's not burning with fire. It doesn't have blackness and, and darkness and tempest covering it. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. What was the writer there speaking to? Now, he, the, he's speaking here uh, of the giving of the law when Moses went on top of the mountain. When he went on top of the mountain and God began to speak, uh, the earth was quaking, there was fire, there was darkness. I mean, there was a great disturbance because of the great voice of God which was speaking. And he is speaking to them about this old covenant He's talking, who, are we, who is he talking to? I've mentioned this every week. I've tried to remind you. He is speaking, the book of Hebrews is to the Jews 
During that time, they have turned to Christ, right? They have turned to Christ. So they're, they're very much aware of Moses on the Mount Sion. They're, they're very much aware of all, all of that's what he's speaking of and he's telling them there. It's important to know that. And uh, that's why we've reminded you each week, who's he speaking to? And uh, there were the 3,000, think about it, the 3,000 souls that were saved on the day. Remember on the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 souls that were saved that day. 100% of those 3,000 were Jews. And the early part of the church, 100% of the church was Jews. They were being saved. The first Gentiles that we know of that were saved and then filled with the Spirit was when Peter goes to Cornelius' house and he's preaching Jesus. He goes back and tells his, his peers, he said, man, you won't, this ain't the King James Version, this is something else. He said, you won't believe it, but the Holy Ghost fell on all of those Gentiles the same way that it fell on us back at the day of Pentecost. And so it's estimated there's about eight years that took place between the day of Pentecost and that day at Cornelius' house. But early in the early church, until the apostles started going out and preaching, most uh, all the church was uh, uh, Jews until you know later on Gentiles started uh, getting saved and coming to Christ. And uh, but here they are now; they're shut out. As Jews, it's turned to Christ. They're shut out of the temple. They're shut out of all the rituals and the ceremony that they're used to going. And they're, I mean, they're acquainted with hearing the law of Moses being read. Uh, that's what he's mentioning here. And so uh, they're shut out from all of that, going to the temple, and no longer are they a part of that system and all. And they feel like they're on the outside. But then here in, in 18 and 21 that we just read, uh, he, he's telling them, you come now to a mountain that is different than Mount Sinai. God has spoken from heaven, and he, it's different than when he spoke and gave the law there. And, uh, and he's telling them, you don't want to go back. This way now of approaching God and what Jesus, our high priest, has done, it's much better than all of that in the past. You don't want to go back there because remember when, when, those, uh, when the law was given the first time, 3,000 souls were slain. Do you remember that part of the story? But a few hundred years later on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit is poured out, 3,000 souls were saved on that day and added to the church. When the law was given, great death took place. But when the Spirit was poured out, great life came on the scene. The, the, these Hebrew Christians had been accustomed to going through the temple going through all of the ritual, now there's nothing for them to go to. Now there's no ceremony, no sacrifice to bring. So the, the writer tells them that they really do have something. Look at verse 22 and 23. But ye, are, right, this is what you are used to. Now this is what you have. But ye are come unto Mount Sion. Oh, it's still a place where God is. And unto the city of of the living God, not Jerusalem on the earth, but heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Who is the church of the firstborn? That's all of those. That's me and you. That those who have been born again, we've been born twice, right? We have been born again, and now, and our names are written in heaven. Heaven, we're you are approaching the God who judges all in the spirits of just men made perfect. That Mount Sion was in, a, I mean, a, a, a very special place. It was David's place. His palace was there. I mean, this is where worship took place. This is where, where it was at, right? To cherish by David and all the Jews, all of Israel. And, uh, but he goes on to describe in part the kingdom of heaven. General Assembly, the church of the firstborn, right? He's speaking of the body of Christ and whose names have been written down in heaven. Look at verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator 
of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Right? He's telling them, this is how you're approaching God. He says, but there is a mediator between God and man. It is written in 1 Timothy 2 and 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is, Jesus is the mediator. He is the in between, right? He was the connection. He was the bridge. It behooved him to become a man tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin because this qualified him to be the sinless, perfect, sacri- the supreme sacrifice. For And now because of him, because of Jesus, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, right? Not because of who I am, not because of what we have done, but because of who he is and because of what he has done, I have access to almighty God, the Savior and the judge of all the earth, and I have attained salvation through Jesus Christ because of him. He is the mediator. There's There's no other mediator except him. They, they right the blood sprinkling. They were used to the blood of goats and bulls. Even the lamb's blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. But the blood of the Lamb of God, who was slain, it was by His blood that we are in this kingdom. And he said, "This blood is crying out better things than Abel's blood." And remember, we've talked about this a little bit during uh, chapter eleven when we dealt with the the heroes of faith and. And uh, we talked about Abel's, Abel's uh, more excellent sacrifice. Well, uh, when he, God comes back and begins to deal with Cain, he says, uh, you know, what's going on? Why, why is it that your uh, brother's blood is crying out from the ground? And uh, so it was, uh, had a voice, but how much more does the blood of Jesus speak on our behalf? Uh, uh, in this hour, amen, for our own uh, salvation in our own life. Look at verse 25, uh, Hebrews 12, 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. God was speaking. There was a shaking that took place on top of the mountain. He said, but now there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, another voice. There's one who's speaking now. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, they refused the Lord. What happened? Well, God just allowed the earth to open up and, 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 and take them, swallow them up, didn't he? They, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Ref, I would say this, refuse him not. Refuse him not. Do not refuse his word. Do not refuse truth. He and he alone is Savior. We cannot refuse him and escape. You cannot refuse the word of God and escape the judgment of God. Can't do it. Can't do it. God is more than, he's not the man upstairs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, he's not. I know that's a common thing. He's not the man upstairs. He is almighty God. And we are to live for him and to carve out our life, our lifestyle, our decisions, and our choices as if we believe that he is almighty God and that he will, we will stand before him one day. But those who choose to refuse his word Those who refuse to choose his sacrifice and his love will not escape the judgment of God. Look at verse 26. Whose voice then, talking about back on the mountain, then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. When did God speak and the earth shake or earth shook? It's connected to the subject we've been talking about. At the giving of the law, there was an earthquake. And at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, 
when he gave up the goats, right, there was a great earthquake. Now God is saying that there is coming a day that he is going to shake everything. Have you seen how, and there was a video I saw the other day that the way that they were picking, it looked like there were oranges or tangerines or something on this tree and this tree was loaded down with fruit and they went up to the tree and they have this uh, machinery that clamps onto the bottom of the tree and then there's a, a big, uh, it looks like a giant upside down umbrella that just would cover the ground underneath the tree and that, that machine would just shake that tree. It seemed like 100 miles an hour. And all of that fruit just began to shake off of that. Uh, that was a, kind of a shaking, I believe, uh, that the Lord is talking about, that there would be a day when everything would be shaken. In heaven and in earth, there will be a shaking. When I, I think about the great tragedies that this world has went through, I think about a shaking that has taken place. I think about the great world wars that have taken place, and I think about a shaking. I think about COVID. Look at the, the what, how a uh, shaking that took place, and and uh, some uh, fell, and some remain. But there was a great uh, shaking, and some of the great shakings on this earth. That loose fruit has fallen to the ground. But those who are attached. Those who are anchored, amen, those who are rooted and grounded in the word of God uh, cannot be shaken, cannot be moved uh, no matter what we face. You say, Master, I might fall down. You may fall down as long as you want to get back up again. That's why the devil hates it so much. He can get people to fail, but they get back up on their feet and they repent and get things right with God. God just puts them right back in right standing with him. Uh, that devil hates that. The devil hates it that he can knock people down and they get up again. The devil hates it that he can come against and seem like he's winning the battle but then all of a sudden God shows up and does something and just rips the rug right out from under him. He hates that but why? Because the kingdom of God is unmovable. It's unshakable because you know why? It's not depending upon you or me but it's depending on the one who hung on the cross, gave up the ghost. He laid him in a tomb and he took back his life again and he's still alive in 2023 and he will be alive forevermore. Can you give the Lord praise tonight? Amen. Look at verse 27. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. The only thing that can remain through the, 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 the shaking that God would place upon this earth is genuine living faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. That's the only way we're saved that's the only way that we're kept. Oh, man, if you are depending upon your own performance, you're going to fall. You're going to be shaken. You're going to fall to pieces. But if you are rooted and grounded in your faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done, it doesn't matter what comes or goes. You're going to be standing in the end of it all. On Christ, there's an old song, On Christ the Solid Rock. I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen. The gates of hell can't stop the kingdom of God. They can't, it can't shake the true church. If it could, it would have a long time ago. Stay in the boat. Amen. Stay in the place of refuge. Look at verse 28. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The kingdom of God cannot be moved. Look what he says. Let us serve the Lord. Let us have grace. Let, let, what does that mean? Let us serve the Lord with gladness. 
to gladly serve the Lord. Serving God is not hard. Amen. Serving God is not hard. He's, he, he's done all the work. Serving God is not a hardship. It's not a, it's not a, a labor, you know, if you will, uh, unless someone has the spirit of rebellion and they can't break loose from it. But serving God is joy. Serving God is the best life to live. Serving God and knowing you're right with the Lord and that He has saved you is the most wonderful life. It is what we have been created to be. We have been designed, right? Human beings have been designed in such a way that when we please the Lord and serve Him with all of our heart, we are filled with joy. We are filled with peace. We are filled with all the good things that causes a human to be content and satisfied and fulfilled because we have been made to sit in heavenly places and to serve the Lord. If serving the Lord has become hard work for you, you're not doing it right. You're, then you're, you're doing it through your own abilities. You're trying to serve Him and lean on the arm of the flesh. Serving God is a joy. Coming to the house of God, oh boy, if coming to the house of God has become for some like, oh man, i got to go to church. I, none of y'all would ever say that. Ever, 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 ever. But if it gets to the point where it's like, oh man, I got to go. You're doing it wrong. Something's not right. Right? But serving God and, and worshiping and pleasing Him is a wonderful thing. It, it's, a, it's where happiness and real joy uh, truly is. When we serve Him uh, with reverence and godly fear. I'll go back to the point I was making in closing. We serve Him with reverence. God is not our peer he is not our butler. He is not our, uh, he's not the man upstairs. He's God. And we are to serve him with reverence and godly fear. What does that mean? That doesn't mean I'm walking around every day just scared to death, you know, of what God's going to do to me. Because God is gracious. God is love. But don't ever think that your next breath can't be your last. Some people are living like as if they say they believe God, believe in God, they say they believe this Bible, but their decisions and their choices are such that they're not really walking and serving God with reverence and fearing Him the way that He should. Because He tells us, for our God is a consuming fire. I'll read with just a couple more verses. Look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. I cannot get away from the message from two Sundays ago. I, I usually preach them and get them out of my system and that's it. I keep going back over and over and over to the part that, this, that God is lusting for you and I. If you weren't here, you go, that's terrible. God doesn't lust. No, no, no. no get your mind out of the gutter because it's just strong desire. God has a desire for you and I that he is unwilling to let us go. He's unwilling. He's not willing that our relationship be cold or indifferent or lukewarm. He, he, he's not willing for those things to be. He is a jealous God. How many of you gentlemen that are, that are married, if you've seen your wife, uh, cheating on you down at the time saver. You know what the time saver is? Some of y'all too young to know what the time saver is. I still call them time savers. They ain't been time savers in years. What do you think would happen? You think you get jealous? How about Brother Wayne? You think you get jealous? 
You seen old Sister Shirley up there? There was something would rise up. I'd beat somebody. But what is that feeling? Because she's the love of my life. She belongs to me and nobody else. That's how God feels about us. That's how God feels about us. And when we, don't, when we refuse his voice, we refuse his spirit, and we refuse his direction and guidance, it's like a wife cheating on her husband. And he is a jealous God, right? And folks, listen, when it comes down to it, he is the only one that matters. He is the only one. He is a jealous God. And so we need to know he, he sees everything, he knows everything, and he cares about it all, and he wants us to be close to him. That's why he loves us the way that he does, and that's why he deals with us the way that he does. We should fear him. Jesus said it like this, and I'll close. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. God is a consuming fire. Amen. And it just blows my mind when I discover things, and you do this as you serve the Lord, you discover him more and more and more, and you begin to realize more and more how much he's in love with us and how much we should return that love to him. Amen. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father God, I love you, Lord. Thank you for your presence here tonight. I, I thank you and love you, Lord, for just for your word. Your word is amazing.